um, and be aware of some things that they might be able to do to have an impact and help to diminish what is going on with human trafficking. Um, sometimes it is not what you expect, and I think you'll learn that today. So again, uh, I appreciate you guys being here and want to welcome you on behalf of our chapter, Arlington Learning, and um, on behalf of our president who had another event, um, Sarah Raquel Jones. So again, thank you for being here. We hope that you enjoy this and get as much information as you possibly can. Thank you. Something along those lines that makes that person 
feel like they have to basically go to the person that got over the board, whatever they did for them. So like I said, there's a couple different kinds of human trafficking. One is sex tra trafficking, and there's labor trafficking. Sex trafficking is the illegal business of recruiting, harboring, transporting, obtaining, or providing a person uh, for the purpose of sex, and we do see this a lot with minors. And there'll be, there's a video in this that I'm just going to do a brief synopsis of uh, a little bit later on when we get to that. Um, but you'll see when I get that, when I get that synopsis, you know, how minors can get caught up in sex trafficking. Labor trafficking is the act of providing or obtaining the labor of a person by use of threat of force, physical restraint, psychological, financial threats, um, and that's what I was saying before, you know, if someone makes that agreement that, you know, like, hey, now you're going to earn me a thousand dollars or I'm going to hurt your family. Now, and they say, you have to work in, in my store now for me. And it kind of becomes that, it, it, it's modern day slavery. It, it really is. And it, they're just continually making these people work for them and they're stuck in a cycle. So what leads to someone becoming a victim? Usually these are people who have something going on in their lives where they are seeking a need to seek love and acceptance. We see this a lot in um, either, again, minors in households or maybe they have a broken in household or they have or having a tough time. Um, we also see these in domestic violence situations where one of the parties is trying to get away and maybe they find someone that they believe is better, but in the end, they're not. Uh, they, they, overall, they just want a better life. They want something, and the person, their trafficker, is the person who initially makes them feel like they had an out, that they have, they have a way to have a better life, and they later on find out that it's not. But it is a continuous cycle, which we will talk about. So this is the video. Oh, thank you. So the video is talking about, um, so I'm just going to a brief synopsis of this. Uh, this young girl, uh, she is 16, 15 or 16 years old uh, when this occurs. Um, she's in high school. Uh, looks like a lot, a lot of y'all are in high school. It's like, you know, going through a lot of changes. And high school's tough, trust me. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that I was in high school. Um, but uh, high school's tough. And on top of that, her parents get divorced and She's having a lot of issues at home, and she feels like she needs an escape. So she goes to the internet, finds a chat room, starts talking to people online. She meets someone else, another girl, online, who kind of says all the right things. Like, I understand how you feel. My parents got divorced too. I miss my dad too. You know, all, all sorts of things that are making her feel like, hey, this person understands me. So eventually, she ends up being in a fight with her mom. The police are actually called. Um, gets back online with her friend and says, hey, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And her friend says, I'll come pick you up. I said, okay. Friend picks her up and she's like, hey, I'm going to take you to my house. <coughs> Next thing our victim knows, she's actually being brought to a hotel. And her friend comes <coughs> outside the hotel and says, hey, it's just, you know, it's my friend's place. We're just going to stay here for a little bit. Turns out that the girl, the victim's friend, friend, is actually working with a pit and is drawing in young women who are now going to be victims of sex trafficking. So this girl, she ends up, I think, going in, I think it was nine or ten different states that she ended up being uh, sex trafficked in. And uh, she ended, she did end up being rescued uh, eventually, but I think it was after about a year she was uh, finally rescued um, after she said that she never even knew what state she was in because the trafficker would put her in the trunk of the vehicle and drive over state lines with her. So that way she wouldn't know where she was and no one would see her. And um, if, in this girl, you can tell she has a lot, a lot of trauma in her life because of this, because she was forced to perform sexual acts against her will. And she was like, like I said, 15, 16 years old when this happens. There we go. We're on the right page. <laughs> so, 
some science is played by victims. They don't have control of any of their possessions. They don't have access to a phone. Uh, if they do, they're only allowed to communicate with people within their trafficking ring. Usually they're pinned in other, other people involved, maybe other females or other guys that are involved um, as victims. Uh, they're not to have control over their, their money. If they're not even allowed to leave their, say, in a house or an apartment. They're not allowed to leave. They are pretty much said, told, you need to stay here. Um, lots of drugs, alcohol, different paraphernalia um, involved. A lot of traffickers will actually constantly give alcohol and drugs to these, uh, to these victims, so that way they're just in a constant state of just loopiness, and, um, and they're just basically just doped up and they don't know what's going on. Um, you can see a lot of foot traffic in and out of the location. So we uh, have seen this in some apartment complexes where there's just a lot of traffic. Random people uh, coming in and out. Random cars just parking in front of a certain building. And uh, that's usually um, customers, if you want to put it that way. Uh, if you are going to speak with them, they won't make eye contact with you. They seem very fearful, very anxious. Um, and when they tell you their story, it doesn't seem to really add up. And, I mean, if you take the girl that I was talking about in the video, she was from, uh, I don't remember what state she's from. Say she's from Texas, and now she's in Arkansas. And she's like, oh yeah, I came from this place to that place. And it, her story may not make sense because she doesn't even know where she's been or where, um, where she's been brought to. She may, some victims don't even know what state they're in. They may only find out the same they're in because they have to see a license plate out the window or something. So, human trafficking occurs everywhere. Uh, we may think of some of the stereotypical spots like nail salons, massage parlors, um, bars, but it can happen in your own neighborhood. Someone could have a house or an apartment and it could happen right there, right down the street from you. It, it literally can happen anywhere. So this is the cycle that I was talking about earlier. So there's a problem. The victim is having a, a rough patch of life. They, they're going through a domestic violence situation. Maybe they're a teen going through a rough time at home. So this is a problem that they are kind of stuck in a rut. And then that relationship forms. The trafficker comes in, or someone who's working for the trafficker, and says all the right things. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make your life better. They um, pretty much make the victim feel as though like they're their bad. And then there's that escape. So they're like, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to go here. We're going to go to my house. We're going to go to this other state. Wherever they decide to take them. And that's that sense of, this, um, of escape for the victim. They're like, I'm getting out of this bad situation I'm in, getting rid of my problem, this is going to solve everything. And the trafficker is going to constantly, you know, give gifts and things to make the victim feel wanted. So, you know, they're going to give them, give them, at that time they're going to give them money, they're going to give them gifts, they're going to give them purses and clothes and anything that they want to make them feel like they are being loved and accepted and give them that sense of belonging. But meanwhile, there's this whole scam going on with the trafficker. So they're really doing all this to pull the victim in and saying, hey, I want you to do this for me. I want you to do this for me. We're, we're going to have someone come over and you're going to do this to them. And the victim feels like he or she needs to do this because they've been given all these gifts and this person has gotten them out of a bad situation. So they may feel like, hey, I need to do this because, like, no, I'm not, they're not saying the trapper, but the trapper's been so good to them. Or so they think. So they're making all this money for them. Trapper may say things like, hey, you know, we need to make this money to keep up the lifestyle we're going, or so you can keep getting more gifts. And if the victim doesn't do it, and what the trapper wants, then there's those threats of violence. They're being psychologically manipulated, <coughs> um, being uh, physically violent, um, 
you know, emotionally, they're putting them down. And that's when the cycle starts again. Now they feel like, I'm stuck in this, I'm stuck in this rut, I've got a problem, and it's either the same trafficker or another trafficker where they start this entire cycle over again. So a couple stats, I won't go through all these, I'll go through some of the, uh, what I feel are the important ones. So, most of these stats are based um, off of 2016, which I think is pretty good based on that 260 stats here from like 10 years ago. So having stats within the last five years, I feel as those are important. Um, there are 40.3 million victims of human trafficking globally. 40.3. 81% of them are trapped in forced labor, and that is either um, uh, sex trafficking or labor trafficking. 25% of them are children. A quarter of 40 million are children. And 75% of those are women and girls. Uh, in 2016, an estimated one out of six endangered runaways reported um, to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were likely to child sex trafficking victims. So, I'll just say, when, when I worked on patrol, I probably took a runaway report once a shift. And working in, in East Arlington, we just happened to, to see that all the time. And that's just me taking a report once a shift. Today we've had two or three going out. So say in two days we've had six runaways. One of those runaway uh, children could be a sex trafficking victim. Right here in East Arlington. And it happens. <laughs> so we just hope, um, like I said, it's all going to be 2016 st uh, statistics here. Uh, so prosecutions are basically when the uh, suspect is given the charge, um, but they're not actually given the <coughs> crime yet, which is people charged. So in 2016, uh, there were 14,897 <coughs> charges for uh, human trafficking. Out of those, uh, just over 9,000 were convicted. And there were about 66,500 victims in 2016. And these are just documented. These aren't ones that we have flown under the radar or that we haven't been able to help or rescue yet. These are just documented ones where we were able to rescue them and find the tra traffickers, charge them, and hopefully convict them like we did about two thirds of them. These are some of our trafficking penalties in Texas, uh, according to uh, Texas Penal Code. So, trafficking of persons uh, is a person commits an offense if, they, if the person knowingly traffics another person with the intent that the trafficked person engaged in forced labor or services, receives a benefit from participating in an adventure that involves an activity described um, by forced labor or services, or they traffic another person through forced fraud or coercion causing the trafficked person to engage in conduct prohibited by our prostitution, which is um, basically just saying, hey, I'm going to do this and I'm going to receive this in return. Promotion of prostitution, which is basically when a, basically a pimp and has uh, just one business or a victim who they are uh, selling out. Aggravated, pro of promote, of aggravated promotion of prostitution, is when there's two or more businesses or uh, victims. And compelling prostitution is prostitution of children. These are some of our human trafficking efforts. Uh, we have a detective who was investigating several high profile cases of human trafficking. Uh, there's a domestic sex trafficking case involving adult and female, uh, adult and juvenile females. Uh, they were in the Dallas Fort Worth area, and this was a full organization, a ring, a human trafficking ring that was in our area. Uh, they were recruited to engage in commercial sex acts uh, under false pretenses, so they were threatened um, with either physical, emotional, uh, financial uh, threats. These were our suspects, they were both indicted. 
Uh, they received they was, yeah, 15 years in federal court. Uh, and we had six minor victims, five rescued. I've been trying to find out what happened to that other one that says five rescued, and I've never been able to actually find out that information. Um, and then there were two adult women who were rescued as well. I'm not sure. I think at the time of this, they were in their thirties. Um, so I believe this was in 2010, 2009. So they're probably in the forties now. They're still in prison. Uh, in 2014, a man allegedly uh, tried to sell a juvenile girl for sex out of South Arlington. Um, it was in a hotel, um, and if I. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was kind of near the highlights in Park Small area. So, not too far from here. Only to about 10 minutes of here. Uh, but actually, the person who was supposed to be the customer was an undercover officer. So, we were able to go in there and actually save that girl from actually being human trafficked. And I don't think it says how long he got in prison here. Um, but those are just some things that we do to help victims of human trafficking. And uh, this case, I'm not to talk about it, but I was uh, helping in a, um, it was a prostitution thing, but we were actually trying to identify uh, victims of human trafficking. So um, we had undercover detectives who were texting people that they would find on Websites similar to Backpage and things you find on a Craigslist, and um, they would have them come to an apartment, and uh, when they basically knocked on the door and they had the agreement on the phone, that was enough for us to actually detain the victim. So we would pull them in. My job was basically the snatcher, right? They opened the door and I grabbed them in, and. You know, we weren't, we weren't trying to get them in trouble, we just wanted to see if they were victims. And we actually did identify three victims of human trafficking during that, out of um, 11 people that we uh, had come to that apartment that day. And it may not seem like a lot, it may seem like three out of 11 is a lot. Some people just make certain life choices, and we can't change that. They got, uh, they, they were arrested for uh, the offense. But the ones who were actually victims, we had um, victims' assistance there, and we were able to get them help that they needed. So, some of the signs. This is this is how you can help. These are some signs that something to look for if you think that there's some sort of suspicious activity going on uh, in your area. So the controller is the only one who's going to speak. So if you have the controller, the trafficker, and then the victim. The trafficker is going to be the only one who speaks. He's going to speak uh, for himself. He's going to speak on behalf of the victim. Uh, if the victim happens to be from another country and doesn't speak English or doesn't speak the language, he's going to be the one that translates. You won't even let them speak in their native language to someone else who may speak their language. Um, and he's also going to be in control and possess all of their items. So I think for the victims, don't possess any of their items, their credit cards, phone, money, he's going to be holding on to all of that. The victim, on the other hand, said they're not going to have anything. They're um, going to avoid eye contact. They're going to be very anxious and fearful. And uh, they may show, uh, show signs of abuse. Um, some of the traffickers are physically abusive, so you may see bruises, scratches, marks on a victim. And they're always going to be compensated for their work. Uh, they're, Basically, if they're paid, they're barely paid. These are some uh, contacts. If you do feel like there is um, any victims of human trafficking, or you have some kind of that feeling, I would say if you have that gut feeling, it's probably something. So, of course, please call 911. You know, we can always send the officers out there to check it out initially um, and try to gather more information. Even just doing that starts a whole, you say, hey, I think there's some sort of human trafficking going out of, out of this location. It kind of just gets the ball rolling. Officer, patrol officers will initially go there, check out the situation. Then it'll actually uh, be sent to our detectives or our vice unit. Our vice unit actually has a couple of detectives who are undercover, who um, specialize in uh, 
human trafficking, that's basically their main focus. The entire unit focuses on it, but there's two detectives who actually, that's a primary focus. Um, we have the National Center of Missing and Exploited Children, as well as the National Human Trafficking Resource Center hotline. And they can um, always give you information. Um, say, say you know the name of someone who you think is being human trafficked. You can see if they're part of the, um, you know, if someone random who shows up in your neighborhood. Usually through the uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children, they can actually look that up and make sure it's not someone who is missing or someone that they're looking for. And a couple of uh, other resources that are in our area who are able to help, who also give presentations and would have some more in-depth information uh, than just the brief overview that I went through. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that they got the comes from Craigslist. Well, obviously, they can't just say woman for sale or whatever. So, are there specific words? So there's actually, it's, it's, and it's been taken down and it keeps coming back, but it's basically a back page site of Craigslist, which is specifically for promotion of prostitution. So it's not like in Craigslist you're just scrolling through looking for lawnmowers and uh, you know, rentals and, and all that. There's actually a secret section where people who are looking for this sort of thing are know what to go to, or, and that's where it would be advertised. Yes? I have a question. I heard on the KRMD that um, they're getting ready to put up signs inside of the water burger because some people are going in asking for, can they look inside the women's restroom? How is that? Have, have you heard of that before? I, I've seen signs um, for awareness of human trafficking. Um, I have seen them a lot in like nail salons and um, massage parlors, <coughs> things of that sort. You actually, Pretty much every nail salon I've ever been into, if you like walk in, it's kind of usually right by the front door. They actually have like saying, you know, if you hope oh, human trafficking is a, a problem, this is how we can help, this is what you should call. So I had to group that word over uh, specifically, but I would assume it would be something kind of along those lines to just bring awareness that it could be happening. So, like I said, it can happen anywhere. It could happen in a fast food way. You never know. I heard because they, I guess it was so. You know, so many times they would always come in and ask, can they go inside the bathroom to look around? I guess it was just happened so many times that they said that they were going to put some signs out in the bathroom so that if you need help, you know, to let someone know. And I've seen that in some restaurants too, uh, usually at like restaurants or sometimes a bar restaurant. So um, I would assume it's along those lines, you know, if you, and I've actually even seen in, you know, bars or bar restaurants where they'll say, hey, if you, feel like you're uh, someone's trying to follow you or something like that and it's potentially human trafficking thing that you can like order certain drinks, you can say certain things, and they'll call you an Uber or they'll, or they'll call the police for you. Um, so that way you don't become a victim of human trafficking. And I've always seen that in a few select places, um, but I think it's a good idea because you could be saving someone's life they just happen to go up and be like, hey, I want a shot of this. And meanwhile, you're calling the police for them because someone's trying to potentially make them a victim. So I would, I would assume it's something along those lines, but it's something I'll definitely get into because I haven't heard about that yet. Yes? Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that they have a victim unit that comes with you guys, like you find um, people that have been involved in trafficking. Have you guys been successful with getting them back to their home, like to their original location? If they are from Arkansas or Ohio, do you guys support them through that entire process? It depends on the situation. So, so like in the um, the sting that I was involved in, these were people that were just in Arlington, and um, and they they were adults. Um, we only we didn't have any minors in that situation. These were all adults. And it was just more of getting them the resources they needed. Um, they were given resources for counseling. They were given resources um, so we can try to, because we actually have some resources that can find them different places to live. So that way, if they're um, traffickers or the suspect, wouldn't be able to know where they are, um, whether that's temporary shelter, getting them an apartment, things of that sort. Um, that's all usually done through our victims, or, uh, victims assistance unit. Um, and they're all licensed counselors that work for the department. 
Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've been doing some, some flying, and I guess the, because Deborah was wanting to have the um, human trafficking thing here, that I was conscious of it. But in the airport, um, they were mentioning it, and I was sitting there waiting for about an hour for the, for the flight. They must have mentioned it like 10, 15 times about being aware of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and I was wondering, is it something that there's an uptick? I mean, I, I just don't remember hearing about it that much over the years. It seemed like in this last year, this last three, four months, it's been like when I go to the airport, I'm constantly hearing it and they're repeating it. I mean, is there something going on? I, I think it's just because we are educating communities more on human trafficking that places like airports and you know other businesses are actually trying to raise that awareness as well. Because there are there is trafficking that goes on through um, airports where they're taking the victims over state lines through um, by airplane and they're just kind of dragging them along with them. So that's, I, I think it's kind of moving towards that, but I think that there's just a greater awareness now and a greater need for education on it that everywhere is trying to do, do their part in making sure that everyone is aware of human trafficking and how you can help. Yes. Um, so I work in, I'm a criminal defense attorney, so I work in the criminal justice system. And before when we had, you know, defendants who were charged with prostitution, human trafficking wasn't an issue. Um, as, not saying it wasn't an issue, we weren't as aware as we are now. So are you seeing less prosecution of people who are prostitutes as, because you think they're victims of human trafficking? Or what's like happening with, with prosecuting people who are like, who are, would have been prostitutes, just regular, you know, prostitute mm -hmm. defendants? So, I think we're still, so uh, I'm, I'm going to just keep using the sting as an example. That, was, that gained a lot of insight being part of this uh, operation that we were a part of, um, is that we, we were given them in that sting citations for operating essentially oriented business without a permit. We're on to the new permits for it, so basically, <laughs> <laughs> so basically if you are doing that, you're doing any sort of prostitution or anything any sort of uh, offense along that line, uh, it's at minimum a citation. So we were giving them citations, um, whether they were victims or not, because the act, the offense still occurred. But at the same time, we were also trying to speak with them on, you know, why they were doing what they were doing. Um, you know, was anyone making them do it? Like we had one guy drop them off and we actually ran his license plate and it came back with a warrant for sex trafficking. So we were able to uh, stop him and arrest him um, and help the victim in that situation, even though she denied for a while that she wasn't a victim, that she was doing this on her own accord, but she was actually a victim. Um, so I would say that we're, we're doing the minimum and I'm sure in cases like that, that tickets more of a formality and it's getting dropped to court later on once we actually get them the help they need. Um, but um, we're going more after the traffickers uh, when we do have a victim. Um, of course, of course, we do still have prostitution where there are people just doing it because that's their life choice um, and they're being um, uh, prosecuted uh, uh, whenever they commit that offense. Anything else I can answer for anyone? I have a question. Yes. Um, here in the Dallas-Fort area, are there any known cases involving military of um, human trafficking? Um, Being that we have the we have two base um, over, we got the NASJRB Fort Worth, and we have a base in Grand Prairie, and then we have Fort Hood down the street. Are there any suspicious or known cases of military human trafficking? Because I know last year. There was suspicious of some Marines um, that was up in um, Los Angeles, California, of human trafficking. So, um, as far as I'm aware, there is not any active cases. Um, if there was, I wouldn't be able to talk about it um, yet because it would be an active case. Uh, but um, we do have those issues, um, unfortunately. There's actually another um, organization called Unbound, and they're in Fort Worth and they um, are a human trafficking organization trying to help victims of human trafficking. And they actually have a presentation where they show 
a bunch of profiles of people and um, say, hey, this person's a military uh, person, this person is this occupation. And there was quite a few people in the military and then they ended up splitting up the list and showing the profiles of those who um, I think were victims and, and those who were traffickers and a good portion of the military personnel were traffickers. Um, which is unfortunate, but uh, it does happen. And um, I, I can't say enough, it can happen anywhere, it can happen to anyone, and anyone can be a trafficker. Um, and that's why it's so important to be aware of your surroundings and be aware of the situations that you're in and that your friends and family are in, so that way we all don't become victims. Uh, we, we are trying to reduce the number of victims and trying to put the bad guys in jail. Uh, I'd like to just uh, interject. Uh, last year we had, uh, with our human trafficking um, program, we had someone from Unbound that was a survivor. Yes. And she had a compelling story mm -hmm. to tell us everything that she went through. And uh, she has since taken a job in Houston. And she just moved, uh, I think she was in the process of moving her last her last day was on balance like last week. Oh, okay. And uh, she was like uh, uh, Julia, I can't think of her last name, but she was she was just remarkable, her story. Very compelling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though some of these victims have been through so much trauma, they, they, they come out stronger and a lot of them want to share their story and, and help others. And um, like like the, uh, the one from Unbound, um, I do remember that she was, uh, when I was in the presentation, she was actually there and, and told her story. And you know, it was kind of those things, one of those things that she's like, this happened to me, it happened to me so easily, I need to help others. Yes. Do we have any statistics on how many cases have been in the Arlington area alone last year? I don't have last year's um, statistics. And some of this isn't, um, we don't, we get it through uh, a national database. Uh, every couple of years we get statistics. So um, right now we only have up until 2016. Um, but I'm hoping that this year we'll get some of the more recent statistics. So that way I can add that to my presentation and have an updated uh, staff on that. Um, but it's definitely something I can try to look into and speak to our uh, vice unit about, see if they can give um, how many cases maybe that they have worked in 2019 related to the trafficking. It's always something I can look into and, and add that information to y'all. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, we see an increase when we have so many sport events in this area, uh, bowl games and things of that nature. Do you see a, an uptick, if I can use, perhaps to use your, your word, uh, or anything like that? And you all surveillance during that time. Uh, do you all partner with other uh, intermental flight uh, officers to kind of uh, protect us from that? Yeah, so there's certain cases that we um, collaborate on uh, investigations. One of the ones I was talking about um, up on the screen, I believe, was like Fort Worth and Arlington. And the thing I was involved in was actually during when the Super Bowl was um, here. Um, <laughs> Super Bowl or the draft, the draft, the NFL draft. Um, and uh, we did it during that time because we had so many people coming in and that's usually what we see in flux in, um, in trafficking and other offenses. So we do do um, more operations during those times because we do uh, recognize that there are more people coming in from out of the area and there's a higher uh, potential for that offense to occur. Yeah. Are we going to see the victims like out on the streets, for one of a better word. I mean, are these women going to basically, or children, whatever, going to basically be held in premises to where they're not out? Because, you know, I mean, there's anxious children all over the place, so is there anything particularly look for when you're in crowds? Uh, and some of them, most of the time, they try to keep them where the traffic tries to keep them, where they have no control over them. So that's going to be like in an apartment or a house or a hotel or wherever they may be. And the trafficker normally has other people working for them. So, like I said, in that um, the stops of the video, um, he had this other female that was working for him, and she was helping kind of keep control. Um, it's kind of like his, uh, his right hand. Um, 
work with that way. Um, but some of the signs I spoke about, like, you know, they, um, they're not really they're not in contact, they're not the ones speaking, they don't have any possessions with them. If they are out and about, that would be some things to look for uh, in terms of victims. Um, and you could walk past someone who's a victim, and you, you may or may not know. Unless you actually interact with them, you probably wouldn't know. Um, but I would say the majority of the time, you're trying to keep them in a, in a way where they can control them better, which is going to be out of sight. Mm -hmm. It's kind of one of things out of sight, out of mind. You know, someone's not going to really know if there's someone that locked up in an apartment or a hotel room if they don't see them. Yes? Well, it appears as if uh, trafficking, trafficking tends to be more female oriented. What are the demographics of the breakdown with males being trafficked? Uh, it's probably closer to about 15 to 25 percent. Um, we, we see, but we do see the majority of women and uh, young women and young girls uh, being trafficked. Um, there are other men, but um, I think, you know, we, we talk about domestic violence and we're always saying the victim is she, the victim is she. And, I, and that's because the majority of the time it is a female victim. Um, but there are male victims, but um, if I had a number to it, I would say 9 out of 10 victims are female. Yes? How do you, like, for example, with the thing, how do you make a distinction between um, and you have a woman there and she says that she's denying that she's a victim, but you, through your professional find out that she is, what are some of the distinctions you make between someone that really is just there because it's their life choice and someone that's denying it because of, you know, fear or whatever mm -hmm. uh, I personally don't deal with the victims too much other than just trying to get them in and actually do the, the uh, detaining portion of it. It's usually the, um, the undercover detectives in our uh, victim's assistance unit that speaks to them more. Um, but I would have to think that a victim really, um, they don't really want to want help um, to say that they are a victim. And I'm sure it's also part of asking the right questions on the detective and victim's assistance part. And you know, they're well versed in that, where they know um, what questions to ask and kind of those, you know, leading questions to hopefully get information to find out if this is a victim of human trafficking or not. Um, but I think it's also going to be on the part of the victim too um, to make that cry for help and to give that information. You know, they may not blurt out like, "Hey, I'm a, I'm a victim of human trafficking," but just little things that they can say to because they're scared. They're scared. Any victim of any uh, crime is, is scared, but especially in this this traumatic situation. When they finally have an out, they it's all I would, I would think that they would not know what to do. That they would just kind of be frozen. And we see that with some of these girls too. Especially, I mean, I, I mean, I, I probably scared all these women because I just grabbed their arms and dragged them into this apartment, with, and they weren't expecting it. So they're kind of shell shocked to begin with. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of just giving them some time. Can you look be there in the car with us for 30, 45 minutes, an hour plus? And sometimes it's just time for them to decompress and talk to them and give them some time. So, um, I, I wish I could answer that a little better for you, but I'm not as well versed in, the, in that part of it, but I can just give my assumptions on that. Thank you. Is there a state or local statute which penalizes um, supposedly legitimate businesses? It's profit from ongoing prostitution. I'm thinking of hotels, motels, um, transportation, limousine services, etc. If they didn't know about it, they would probably fall under some of the penal code offenses that I spoke about. And it kind of depends on what their role in it um, is in it as well. So, but they would probably fall under the promotion of prostitution, <coughs> aggravated promotion, compelling prostitution. What's the age of the youngest case that you worked or are aware of in our area? Uh, the operation I worked, the youngest was 18. Um, I'm not sure the youngest is uh, in cases in Arlington, but I have heard of victims as young as like 13, 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So, on the question of this was yesterday, and they said that uh, Texas ranks number two for, for human trafficking, and Dallas is number one as far as the city. Where does Arlington fit in with 
there. Because have you done the same piece? Because when you see on Facebook, you see somebody who's trying to abduct somebody from your uh, local Walmart mm -hmm. and from Cooper. And what is, are you all working with those major stores as well? And we do work with those stores. Um, we do take those reports. Um, I watched that video that was posted on Facebook uh, about that um, incident at Walmart on Cooper. And uh, it sounds like we were involved and that we uh, did either take some sort of report or um, even if there was no actual offense, we would still take an incident report, which can be uh, forwarded to the correct unit so that they can be looked into. Um, hopefully maybe some uh, more severe surveillance can be done in that area to try to identify uh, the suspects in those. Um, I don't know exactly where Arlington falls in terms of kind of ranking, mm -hmm. if, if, um, if I'm understanding it correctly. Uh, with Perhaps you have an increase, though. You have to know that you notice an increase in the Arlington area. I would say it's... At least Arlington area, since you're Arlington. I would say just based on what I know, it's, it's just kind of a steady, like, you know, we, we have it. Mm -hmm. We have it. There hasn't necessarily been an increase or decrease, but we do do our part to educate the public, um, educate like we are today, um, educating you all on what can be done. Um, and you know, it's, it's, it's always going to be a battle because we're going to rescue some and there's always going to be more that become victims. So we can only just do our part to rescue the victims and try to help uh, make sure that there aren't any more victims in the future. Yes. You said, for instance, you do run into something like a situation that someone is in there. How do you get the ball rolling for that individual or that person to get help? Just call 911. That, that's kind of the first step, especially you know, here in Arlington. That's the first step to just get some sort of either report or call number generated and say, hey, I, I think there's some sort of human trafficking or some sort of prostitution going on in, in this, say it's an apartment, in this apartment uh, number. And that way, you know, the most patrol officers can do is knock on the door and if someone answers, then they can ask some investigative questions. If no one answers the door, we can't force our way in there. Um, even if there are signs of you know some offense occurring, we have what's called exigent circumstances. So unless someone's like screaming, he's trying to kill me, or we hear gunshots, or something along those lines, we can't just go breaking down doors. Um, but that at least gets the ball rolling, because then you know when there's certain words in like the call text or the comments that an officer puts in this is like human trafficking, prostitution, that gets forwarded to another unit, so that way they can further investigate. So um, that's kind of what makes a poll rolling, uh, is just calling that one once so we can start that process and generate some sort of report or some sort of call. Well, thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Therapy, group therapy, 
um, and then cognitive behavioral therapy, um, just to build awareness about where they are at the time. But the first thing is we'll have to assess their survival methods. So safety, shelter, food, clothing. Um, so the little girl I had, she was, um, her mother had, I believe, six or seven children, and she didn't have custody of any of them. Her grandmother didn't know she existed and found out and got custody of her. So she would consistently run away. She had a whole bunch of attachment issues. So one day she left the house because she was upset because she had to do dishes. She left. She went, ran out the house and started going down the street and there was a woman and another girl cruising the neighborhood. And they asked her, was she okay? What was wrong with her? Did she need to go somewhere? And she said, I'm sick, my grandmother, blah, blah, blah. So she gets in the car with these strangers. She leaves and they take her to a house and it's in Arlington, it's off of Mansfield Web somewhere. I never found out exactly what the house was and the grandmother didn't either. She just knew it was in the area because somebody had seen her over there. So they take her to the house and the little girl, when she came back to therapy with me, she explained what happened to her there. She said when she walked in the house, there was like a, a couch and then just a table. And the table was full of condoms. That's the only thing that was in the house. There were other kids there. The kids, she said there was nobody there older than, I would say, 16, I think is the girl that helped pick her up. And so there were various rooms in the house that one was there, she was in her own room, and she would lock the door, and the little girl, my kid, saw people coming in and out of the um, house, but she said that she spent the whole time crying because she was scared, and she knew she, what was going on because she could hear other people in the house. So they, her grandmother was frantically looking for her. She called the police several times. They were cruising for her, driving around. Well, the lady who ran this house got wind of it, and so she said, you need to let her go. She is too much trouble, and somebody loves her. So they took her back to, I don't know, it was like two blocks away from her house and dropped her off, and she went home. She didn't know where she was because, you know, she was 11, she was a kid, so she didn't pay attention to the address. She could just show her grandmother Mansfield with it. So, as I said, that is here in Arlington. Not that far from us. I don't know if that lady ever got caught. So that, you know, makes me think about the instance. And just like um, you were talking about the video for the lady at Walmart, it was because she was paying attention. We're, I'm guilty of it. <coughs> We are on our phones too much. Sometimes we just do not pay attention. If that lady had been wandering around Walmart and not paid attention, she could have gotten taken because like she said there were like three people kind of casing her and trying to take her with them. So we have to be aware, we have to pay attention. As far as internet dating, I have another horror story. I had a 15 year old girl. Um, she was upset with her parents, she was online and her parents did not know she was online, and so she was talking to this guy that supposedly was 15 as well. So she coordinates with this guy for him to sneak into her house. So he comes to her house to the window. He's like, she said he had to be like 25, 25 or 30 or something. She said he was an adult. But at that time, she was nervous because she was still worried about her parents hearing because they were in the house sleeping. So she goes ahead and lets this guy into her room. So of course he, First, he, he didn't really try to force her, but he did coerce her into having sex with him. This girl was a virgin. She was a young girl. She ended up having sex with this guy. He leaves. She finally tells her parents what's happening. They track him down somehow. I don't know if he used his real name, but they prosecute him. But then also, about two months after that, she found out she had herpes. As I said, we have to be careful. We have to pay attention. We have to be vigilant. Trust your instincts. And part of that goes along with having good mental health. If you're in distress and you're not taking care of your mental health, it can make you vulnerable to things like this. If you're depressed, then somebody says they have a small island of heat for you and you'll believe it. So you have to take care of your mental health so that you are aware of what's going on with you and won't fall for these kind of things. And I don't want to say don't trust people um, because we have to trust somebody, but we have to really, really be cautious. And I just see people throwing out trust 
left and right. And then they're coming to me trying to heal from those wounds. And that trauma stays with people. You know, the PTSD symptoms of a sex trafficking victim, victim are long lasting. That's not going to be something that happens overnight. Um, some of the prevention things that I also found in my notes, I talked about paying attention, avoid walking alone. If you can, go somewhere with somebody. And I know a lot of us will run, Walmart and all this school if I go tonight. That article made, I mean, that video made me start taking a second to think twice about going to or anywhere in the middle of the night. So, you know, things like that, try to go somewhere with someone. Um, be careful on social media. Be ready for anything. You know, I really am trying to find a self-defense class where they have that big dumb thing that you can kick and karate chop. So I can't <laughs> <try that. laughs> Somebody tries to come up and grab me or something. But just even regular, you know, self-defense techniques. I think we all need to know that and have, even if it's just a short course on that, to help us. Um, meet strangers in public places. So if you are going to online date or meet people online or any of that, even friends, because we also know that there's a lot of recruiting of the young people specifically with the friends yeah. that, you know, they, they have a new, a new girl moves to school, come hang out with me. And then the, I think they call it the boyfriend technique where they'll pretend like they're your boyfriend and then all of a sudden, like you said, then they're saying, hey, well, do this favor for me or do this favor for me and my friends. Um, if you are bold enough to go out, don't drink and do drugs because that lowers your defenses and you won't be aware or paying attention to what's going on with you. Those are pretty much my tips. Um, some ways to notice in um, children if they may be being trapped is if you work in the school system and you notice that they start missing school or they're sleepy at school or their behavior changes drastically then those are signs, you know, don't just automatically assume, oh, this is a bad kid. Just find out what's going on with them and why they behave, their behavior changed. Because most of the time, our children are the symptom carriers of whatever is going on in our house. Mm -hmm. So it might end up not being trafficking, but it could be that they're in a domestic violence situation, sexual abuse situation, all these situations, because they're, in most cases, powerless to you know, fight against some of those things, and so they act out in other ways to get attention. And most of them won't tell you straight out because they're fearful of the consequences that might happen if, you know, if nothing happens. So if they report, let's say, child abuse, and it becomes unfounded, then they get sent back into that environment. And so a lot of times they won't tell because they don't want to be put in that situation. That's all I got. <laughs> Anybody have any questions from a mental health perspective or questions about mental health in general? Or what I said about the... I'm just curious about the child being taken. How long ago was that? Um, it's been two years now. And she's, she was in and out of mental health facilities and things like that. So she was home for a while, but she's almost 18 now, so unfortunately. She already, and she already had trauma coming into it. And that's also one of the factors. Somebody who comes from a trauma background is more susceptible to that as well. And then one of the things that I have to talk about with my clients is starting the boundaries yeah. after the awareness. What's some of the, the things that you kind of help your clients with as far as starting those boundaries? Because I think that a lot of people in general, especially us as women, who don't have boundaries. No. Well, that starts with no, <laughs> saying no, and we are, we need to set boundaries with everybody we know. I'm not saying, saying go around and be mean to everybody and tell everybody no, but we tend to let our family members and people we love get away with more things. So let your no mean a no, be a no. You know, um, as far as setting boundaries, sometimes people are overwhelmed by boundaries. I work with a lot of clients who have emotionally abusive situations, they don't really know how to turn those around and they don't know, they don't really necessarily want to leave. And so I start them out by setting just one boundary. If you try to set, if you have somebody that's stepping on 10 boundaries and you try to do 10, you're going to be discouraged because it just might not work out right away. So I always tell people pick one boundary. In my own situation, my first boundary was you don't get to talk to me crazy anymore. 
And so once I set that boundary, it brought on other things um, like proximity abuse, like not hitting me, but you know, standing over me and things like that. And so it just progressed kind of from there. And so I ended up getting out of that situation. But that started with just one boundary on my part and saying no, no more of that. Alright, if you guys want to talk to me afterwards, you have something you don't want to ask out loud, then you can approach me after and then I also have cards with me to reach out to me.